Okay, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This morning we're going to talk about Halloween and Satan. Um, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Okay. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay, there's a, a certain sense in which you should know how the devil does things. You should know about Satan. Um, you shouldn't be ignorant of his devices, because if you are, he can get an advantage of you, over you. Okay, um, I just want to pray, because this is kind of a dangerous subject to speak about, so... Let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I put a lot of time into this message, and uh, it's a very dangerous subject, as I just said. And uh, whenever you talk about the devil, uh, I, I think that that's something that he's not real happy about. And I know he has um, plenty of agents out there, Lord, that um, you typically get hit with some spiritual warfare at a time like this. So I just pray that this morning that your Holy Spirit would be here among us and that your blood would um, protect us from the devil and then uh, that you would just speak through me and help me to get this message out and um, that this would bring glory and honor to you and to your word. And I ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so the Bible says that we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Turn back to Leviticus chapter 18. I just want to give a short history of Halloween. What's the founding of it? Where did it come from? Um, and we're going to look at some verses here in the book of Leviticus that relate to this. But basically, Halloween is a Celtic holiday. Um, it was originally called Samhain, uh, spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N. Um but it's pronounced Samhain. It's the Druids were the ones that basically founded the thing. And Samhain was their lord of the dead. That's what they called him. And this was the time that they would commit human sacrifices and things like that to appease this god. The pagan people oftentimes would commit different sacrifices to appease different gods. And even today, and I'm going to show you some of this, even today the Druids... There are still Druids around. Druid uh, witchcraft is very popular here in America right now. And uh, the, their practices are, are still the same as they were centuries ago. But their two most important holidays, holy days, are Samhain and Beltane. Okay? Samhain is October 31st. Beltane is May 1st. Okay, so those are their two big days. And I could say a lot more about those, but... Essentially, what they would do is on October 31st, they would dress in scary costumes, the Druidic priests, and they believed that that would ward off evil spirits. It's kind of interesting because they're serving evil spirits, you know, kind of weird. But they would go around to houses to get victims to sacrifice. That's what they would do. And they would go to a house and they would say, we want one of your children. Now, the people had an option. They could either give the child up or they could say, no, we're not giving our child. Now, if they would give the child, the Druids would take a hollowed out pumpkin or a turnip and they would put it on the door, you know, there in front of the door. And, of course, it would be lit, which is jack-o'-lantern. And there's, there's a lot of other things there with the whole jack-o'-lantern thing. But if the people said no, you know, we don't want it we're not giving one of our children away, they would paint a hexagram on the front door in blood. Okay? Now, that's very significant because um, part of what the Druids would do then, I'll just finish this and then I'll go back and explain the, the hexagram. But part of what they would do then is they would take <clears throat> these victims and they would put them inside wicker or structures made out of sticks and they would basically burn them. And the way that they would die would signal, well, we're going to have good crops this coming year or we're going to have a hard winter or a light winter or whatever. That's what they would do. And, again, I can say it's still practiced. Um, 
but they would before they would burn their victims they would allow them to they would have a cauldron there with boiling water and they were allowed to bob for apples and if you could get an apple you were allowed to you wouldn't be sacrificed that night problem was it was boiling water so it would it would disfigure the person and this is the practice that was practiced and you say well how do you know all this stuff is true well there's a guy who was raised as a witch his name is Doc Marquis, and I have a video from him, and, and he's a Christian now. Uh, he got saved, but he was taught all of these traditions. Being raised in witchcraft, they're taught it, just like a uh, Christian child is taught about the Bible and about Jesus and everything else. He was taught about witchcraft. Uh, so I have his testimony, plus I have a lot of other books uh, that talk about this. Um, anyhow, that was the their Halloween celebration there their sacrifice to Samhain and they believe that if they would sacrifice it's kind of interesting too because you have Satan Samhain it's very similar there but they would sacrifice to this pagan deity and they believe that that would you know give them good crops and whatever else that's the way they would do it but as far as um this thing of burning people to death as a sacrifice. Look at Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21. Okay. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. So you see this thing, and that appears many times throughout the Old Testament, this thing of letting your seed pass through the fire. Okay, there is, this is a very ancient practice, this thing of burning children to appease pagan deities and i have a book here a six-pointed star by dr oj graham i want to read the back of it here um because a lot of people think that this six-pointed star is a symbol for the jews it isn't and this is this man by the way is a jewish christian he is a pure you know jew and he says Originally pagan, the six-pointed star, or hexagram, has been used in Baal worship from the days of Genesis. Rebuked in Amos chapter 5, verse 26, it became known as the seal of Solomon after Solomon married the daughter of Pharaoh, built an altar to Ashtaroth, and entered into Baal worship. Since then, usage has continued in Solomonic rituals in the craft of Freemasonry. Long used in magic and witchcraft, the six-pointed star has been used as the chief symbol of worship to Moloch in burnt human sacrificial rituals. Used by druids and astrologers, the six-pointed star has been used consistently in the occult and was used by occultist Adolf Hitler during the Holocaust. In more recent times, it has almost replaced the seven-branched candlestick which was given to the Israelites as an everlasting covenant. Is the 666 seen in the six-pointed star a sign of things to come? And there is much, much more. Um, this is a very good little book. And this is written by a Jew. So people can't say, well, you know, he's not Jewish. Yes, he is. He's a Jew. And there's a lot of Christians walking around that they'll wear these little six-pointed stars saying, it's I'm supporting Israel. That's not the thing. To, if you want to support Israel, don't wear the six-pointed star. But Amos 5.26 and Acts chapter 7 verse 43 both describe this star of their god, uh, Moloch. Okay? So you see this thing of this six-pointed star being connected with burning children. And that's what the Druids did. Okay? So just wanted to say that very quickly. And by the way, I've done a lot of research into the occult, and I had a, a witch's encyclopedia, and I ended up burning it be, for different reasons. But, yeah, amen. And um, But they actually had, in this witch's encyclopedia, it was not written by Christians or something like that. It was a witch's encyclopedia. And it had that Lancaster County is one of the oldest places for witchcraft in America. And, you know, our old barns here had hex signs on them. Okay, and you can still see them some places. They will have the hexagram right in the design. And there's that's a whole huge study, and he really covers it well in this little book. If you want to get that, that's a good book. But um, look at verse 24 there in Leviticus chapter 18. Well, actually, we'll go up to 22. Um, 
God is describing a lot of the pagan practices here in, in Leviticus chapter 18. But he says, verse 22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Well, hate crime legislation or not, it's still an abomination. It's Sodomy is, is wicked. It's an abomination. God does condemn it in both the Old and the New Testament. Verse 23, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. Most certainly is. Uh, defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. Uh, and the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled, that the land spew not you out also, when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs, which ye, which were committed before you, that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. Now, you know, I think a lot of Christians kind of struggle with the thing of you read the Old Testament and you see this thing where God is telling the Israelites, Go into the city and kill them all. Kill man, woman, beast, children, everything. Other times he said, go in and just kill the men. Or go in and kill the men and the beasts. Whatever. And a lot of people struggle with that and they say, you know, the God of the Old Testament can't be the God of the New Testament. Well, he is. And the reason, why did God kill these ancient peoples? Well, because right there. They were practicing all these abominable things. And... Inevitably, whenever you have these abominations, these sex perversions and worship of other gods and things and sacrifice and whatever, who's the one that always suffers the most? Children. The children are the ones that get defiled. And, you know, you read in the New Testament where Jesus said about, you know, if you offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it were better for a millstone to be hanged around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. God doesn't like children to be defiled. That's very, very wicked in his sight. And so, of course, what's Satan going to do? Satan wants to defile the children. So that's why God said, go on in there and kill them, wipe them out. Well, today it's not the same thing. God's not telling anybody to go and wipe out whole groups of people. The fact of the matter is, the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse even a witch and a cultist, somebody that's involved in these things, that are mentioned in Leviticus chapter 18. And you have a lot of guys out there. Johnny Todd was one. Doc Marquis. Bill Schneblin. I'm going to read one here soon. Doreen Irvine was another one who was a witch. And they got saved. And their lives are changed. And they, by the way, their lives are changed. They, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You don't stay in witchcraft and be a Christian. But that's why... God killed a lot of these, had the Israelites kill a lot of these people back then because they were involved in the very practices that druids and witches practiced down through the centuries and are still practicing today. Uh, but how did it become Halloween? Well, the Catholic Church, Mystery Babylon, um, they have a way of, they call it sanctifying paganism. And so what they'll do is they'll take pagan practices and they will put Christian names to them. And they'll tweak it a little bit and change it a little bit so that they can draw pagans in. And that's what they've always done. And it's because they're the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. They are the church that is above everything else, and they're kind of controlling things. And, I don't, again, I don't have time to get into that, but um, what happened is back... I forget the year, but it was it was you know back during the Dark Ages, essentially the Catholic Church started to they they made a day called um, All Souls Day, where they would worship um, and and pay honor and tribute to their Catholic saints, essentially. 
Okay, and this later became All Hallows Day, which turned into All Hallows Eve, turned into Hollow Even, and eventually Halloween. But they had it on October 31st, was their day. That basically, their All Souls Day was technically November 1st, but they celebrated the evening before that. Okay, so they took this day of Samhain that was Druid, it was pagan, and they sanctified it. Okay, and by the way, that's not of the Lord. We have this movement today of Christian rock and things like that. And they say, you know, there was an, actually an old song. I remember when I was young, back in the 1980s, it was a quote-unquote Christian song called, Why Does the Devil Have All the Good Music? That's the name of the song. It was a rock song, supposed to be Christians. See, and what they did is they said, well, yeah, rock and roll and heavy metal, that's the devil's music, but we can Christianize it. No, you can't. Okay, you cannot Christianize it. But uh, just as one further way to prove that, that modern-day witches do celebrate Halloween, I actually have here, I don't have very many of these in my collection, just simply because uh, I don't feel right about it, but this one here, I'm going to be using it for probably making a video in the future, but this is a witch's book of rune casting. Okay, this is not a Christian book <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Again, I don't recommend that Christians have these in their library because uh, it is an evil book, but um, I got it for some research purposes, uh, actually research on the Lord of the Rings, which Tolkien was a member of the Order of the Golden Dawn and pagan himself, but that's a whole other story. Um, but basically it says here, November Eve, the eighth great festival was celebrated on October 31st, November 1st. So that even they admit that the thing of this November 1st, this All Souls Day, uh, like the Catholic Church did. Um, it wasn't just October 31st, in other words. Uh, it marks the onset of winter and survives today as Halloween. It was considered to be the time when the veil between the human realm and the spirit realm is at its thinnest, so divining the future is easier on this day. You may like to wear an Uraz rune, uh, talisman to help you tune into cosmic energies while performing rune casts. I don't recommend that. <laughs> you don't want to get any cosmic energies on you. Uh, now, is Halloween wrong for Christians? Well, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Everybody there? The Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay, now, is there any appearance of evil connected with Halloween? Yes. Yeah? You know? And let me just say something for the record. I went trick-or-treating as a kid. And it's not because we were pagans, it's because we didn't know any better. Okay? And, you know, I didn't I didn't go out with blood dripping or anything like some of the kids do, you know. You know, it was fairly innocent. You know, we didn't go. I, I don't even remember what I dressed up as. But the point is, a ghost? Casper the Friendly Ghost. Oh, yeah, it was Casper the Friendly Ghost. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't know any better. But the point is, we, we as Christians are to abstain from all appearance of evil. But I want to just show you something very quick. It's kind of interesting. I'm going to read from the Satanic Bible here, the NIV and show you how they render that verse. Oops, back in 1 Peter here. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 and in an NIV says, Avoid every kind of evil. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the appearance of evil. Not kind of evil. So, you can say, Well, yeah, you know, I'm dressing up as a witch, but I'm not. It's just pretend. You see? It's, I'm not a witch, actually. I'm just dressed like one. No, the Bible says the appearance of evil. You're supposed to abstain from the appearance of evil. Not the evil itself, even, but just even the appearance of it. You know, it'd be like if you had a daughter and, you know, I'm going to dress her up as a prostitute. Now, she's not a real prostitute. We're just going to make her look like one. Say, no. And I can tell you right now, I believe in God's sight that a witch is a lot worse than a prostitute. 
because a witch will do all the things that a prostitute does. I mean, this book right here, Doreen Irvine, she was a witch back in the 1950s, and she was a, pro a professional prostitute and a stripper over in England. I mean, she was a very wicked woman. And what she was doing in witchcraft is a lot worse than what she was doing with prostitution. Okay? So, of the two, witchcraft is a lot worse. Okay? I'm not trying to justify you know, prostitution, but the point is, they're both bad. If you would say, I, don't, I won't let my child dress up like a prostitute, why would you let them dress up like a witch? Bad idea. Okay? So, we're to abstain from all appearance of evil. <coughs> Okay, Psalm 101, verse 3. Go back there. Okay, Psalm 101, verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now that's very interesting. That's one of the most important verses in the Bible right there. You know what the biggest problem is with setting wicked things before your eyes? It'll cleave to you. It'll be in your head. You know, I used to watch movies and things. I, you know, I was, I didn't have much conviction about that years ago. I was very far away from the Lord. And I would watch horror films and whatever. And you know what? Those images are still with me. I can still see them in my head. And that's why as a Christian you should say, I'm not watching that because it's going to cleave to me. I don't want anything to do with it. And you know, Dr. Ruckman made a good statement to one video of his, and he said, you can't sin unless you have images in your head. Okay? You go to a, some heathen out in the jungles of Africa somewhere, and you say, hey, what do you think about Playboy magazine? He'd go, what? I don't know. I've never heard of it. See? And he isn't going to be able to be defiled until he actually sees it. See, you, they're not going to know what pornography is, you know. They wouldn't know. But you know when you've seen it. And let me tell you, if you see that kind of thing, as much as you fight it and whatever, it will still be in your head. It will cleave to you for the rest of your life. Now, you can read the Bible, you can pray, you can witness, and kind of put that stuff away. But those images are always going to be there. That's why you should never set anything wicked before your eyes as a Christian. You should you should flee from that stuff. Just get it away from me. I don't want anything to do with it. You know. Um, but let me just I want to read a quote here from Doreen Irvine. She like I said she was a witch, actually the queen of black witches. And in the occult, black and white does not have anything to do with the color of your skin. Black and white has to deal with different types of magic. Black magic is casting spells to hurt people. It's evil magic. It's the left-handed path. Whole other thing. Um, white magic is good magic. Of course, it's deception. It's all black magic. But uh, she was a black witch, meaning a, a evil one, sinister one. And she went to a world conference of witches. They met together back in the 1950s. And I've, this has been verified by a number of other people. Bill Schneblin talked about this. A lot of them talked about it, that there was this world conference of witches back in the 1950s. Remember that. 1950s is when this was going on. And she says here, Many discussions were held, the most important subject being how to make black witchcraft more appealing. Many people, especially the young, were taking a fresh interest in the occult. It was important to give witchcraft a new look, and these guidelines were laid down. Never frighten anyone. Offer new realms of mystery and excitement. Make witchcraft less sinister. Make it look like natural, innocent adventure. Everyone is attracted by adventure and mystery. Cover up evil with appealing wrappings. Isn't that interesting? A couple years later, 1960s, they came out with Bewitched on TV. Very innocent very innocent. I mean, she wiggles her nose and does the dishes and stuff like that with some kind of a spiritual power. Didn't look evil. Looked very nice. And now that they have gotten that innocent look of witchcraft and that innocent, you know, Sabrina the Teenage Witch and all these cute little fun things, now they come out with the darker things. And Harry Potter started out very innocent, very nice little boy, you know, and everything, and 
casting little spells, and and as it gets more and more progressive, it gets worse and worse and worse and more and more evil and darker. And they even say it in the newspaper, you know, I have plenty of articles on that, where they say about Harry Potter's taking on a darker look, you know. So that was a plan of the witches. And why did they do that? Well, we're going to see about that here as the sermon progresses. Turn, turn over to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 35 is where we're going to go next. Here's another problem that I have with Halloween, and I think the Lord has this problem too. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 35 says, For whoso findeth me findeth life. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Life is associated with Jesus Christ. Um, back to verse 35, And shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. What holiday more than any others celebrates death? Halloween. I mean, we were out door to door that one time and when we were still at Liberty. And we went up to that one house and they had on the front porch as part of their decorations a body laying there with a severed head and fake blood all over the place where the, the head was cut off and the head's laying over about four feet away. Why would you decorate your house that way? See? And you got these things. Went past this house the other night and there's these little hands coming up out of the dirt and they're glowing, you know, and flashing. And I thought, you know, if that was actually real and some demonic creature was coming up out of the ground... Would you sit out there on your porch and, oh, is that, look at that, that's neat. You know, people don't think about that. But at Halloween, there's this celebration of death, which you go back to the Druids. Who were they celebrating? Who were they sacrificing to? Salween, Lord of the Death. See, it's that same pagan influence. Okay, turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. You say, well, yeah, but God killed people back in the Old Testament there. He was killing people right and left. Well, let's look at Ezekiel 33, and we're going to see about that. Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Okay, Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? God never enjoyed killing anybody. He does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. God's desire is that all men come to repentance. He's not willing that any should perish. I think it's a very sad thing for God to have to condemn somebody to hell. He isn't up there laughing about it and ha, 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 I got another one, you know. Oh, look at those people down there getting slaughtered. No. They're his creation. And the Bible says that when Jesus was here on this earth that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Can you imagine being God manifest in the flesh and walking around down here in this mess <laughs> and knowing their thoughts? I mean, wow. You know, how vexing that would have been to see the people that you gave life to and these dear little children and everything, and, and to, to read people's minds and know what they're thinking. It would have been rough. So God does not associate with death. He is not up there enjoying it. Okay? Um, but now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to see the instructions for the Christian about certain things like Halloween. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19. What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Uh, Salween is not some kind of a mystical 
pagan deity that the, is honorable and it's a devil it's the devil but a lot of these other gods that they sacrifice to and they talk about and and uh you know Astarte and and Osiris and Isis and all these pagan deities they're devils is all they are they're not the queen of heaven or she's a devil you know that you read about back in Jeremiah okay that's what they are there are no other gods God is the only one that we should be worshiping Okay, but look at verse 21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, when you when you worship some of these other deities, either knowingly or unknowingly, you're provoking the Lord to jealousy. Okay? God is very jealous over his children. He wants their worship. Um, verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Okay. Can a Christian go trick-or-treating? All things are lawful for me. Yes. A Christian can go trick-or-treating, but is it expedient? No, not really. Will it bring honor to the Lord? No, not really. But let me say this. Should you, what should be your reaction at Halloween time? Should you bar your door and turn out all the lights and everything? No. You can use it to bring honor to the Lord, like my younger sister did, over 250 tracks handed out on one night. And they're coming to you. <laughs> I mean, you don't even have to go door to door. They come to your door. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity. There are some churches that have harvest parties, they call them. You know, and they, and they have the kids come dressed up as Bible characters. Okay. You know, it's a time of fellowship, a time to get together as Christians. All right. You know, I think you should be at home, you know, getting tracks out to people. I mean, you can time it so that you are home at that time. But the point is, can you... For a Christian, you should always look at it as all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Is this expedient? Does it edify? That's the standard there for a Christian. And let me just say very quickly that if you do the research, and I'm not going to go into this whole thing because it's a whole other study, but most of our holidays are of pagan origin. Christmas, Easter. Christmas is Saturnalia in the ancient Roman world. It's, it's Yule for a witch. Um, Easter is mentioned in the Bible as Herod intended after Easter to bring Peter out. And, and that's the right wording there. Herod was a pagan. He was not a Jew. He would, it's, many of the new versions say Passover, wrong, you know, it was Easter. Uh, which, again, another study. But the point is, both Christmas and Easter can be used to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. And they have been used for that. Yes, they are of pagan origin. You're going to have to work that thing out on your own as far as how much should you do of Christmas, how much of Easter should you do, whatever. But at Christmas time and Easter time, you have people come to church. You have, you know, Easter Sunday, Christmas Sunday. You know, come on, kids, let's get in the car. It's, you know, Christmas. Let's go for the Christmas service. Well, today's November 1st, one day after thanks or one day after Halloween, not Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up, and that's that I would call a Christian holiday, by the way. But um, how many people do you think are in church this morning because it's Halloween Sunday? Hmm. None. <laughs> you know, come on, kids, get out of bed. It's Halloween Sunday. We got to go to church. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I don't think that's going to happen. So, what should you do about Halloween as a Christian? Well, you can use it as a time as a ministry to people in the community. But I'd be real careful about the thing of trick-or-treating because it is an ancient pagan practice. If you know about it, again, you're going to have to work that thing out. It's lawful for you. All things are lawful for you as a Christian. But does it edify? Is it expedient? Okay. Maybe if you're out there and you can pass out some tracts or something, okay, whatever. And I think that if you're 
Christian and you have a house, you should be putting tracks in with the candy that you give out. You can use it to bring honor to the Lord. But now, because yesterday was Satan's big special day, I just want to, if he's listening to this or gets a chance to listen to it, I want to remind him of uh, what the Bible says about him and what his future is. So turn back to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. We're going to look at uh, two passages here that talk about Satan before he fell. Or rather, why he fell. I guess I should say that. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Okay. Move it here. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thou say, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee, thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Okay, Satan was an anointed cherub. And of course, that's a really interesting study there. There's a lot of things that you can look at, but... He was an anointed cherub, and because of his beauty, um, he was lifted up. He had pride, and he wanted to be like God. Well, where does it say that? Well, turn back to Isaiah 14. And we're going to look at another passage here. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 16. Okay, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will, send, uh, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Okay, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Okay, now, for those of you who don't know, I think most of us here know this, but for the listeners especially, I'm going to read Isaiah 14, 12 in the NIV. Um, actually, no, let me, before I do that, keep your hand there in Isaiah 14, 12. And turn back to Revelation 22. We're going to be comparing these two, so that's why it's important to keep your hand there. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Okay, we read, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Okay? 
That's the King James Version. All right, it says, I, Jesus. Now let me read it quickly here in the NIV. Got to get there first. Revelation 22.16, NIV. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you the, this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So it's close to the King James Version. But now watch what they do in Isaiah 14.12. Okay, now you see there, Isaiah 14.12, King James Version says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Here's the NIV. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. Now, if you search the Hebrew text, and I think it's any Hebrew text, whether you use the Masoretic Hebrew or the Stuttgart uh, edition there, the word star is kokab in Hebrew. It does not appear in Isaiah 14, 12. Why would they put morning star in? And there are people, actually, there's a, a charismatic guy, uh, Kenneth Hagin, I think his name is, who teaches that Jesus got kicked out of heaven because he tried to be God. Seriously. And, it, you know, in the occult world, you have Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society, and she taught that Lucifer is God. Well, now, if you use these references in the NIV, you could teach that same thing. You could teach that Jesus is Lucifer. He was the one that got kicked out of heaven. I mean, it says right there, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations. I mean, it's saying Jesus got kicked out of heaven. Morning star is back here. And I actually have, let's see, it doesn't say it in this one, but I actually have an NIV but back in Revelation 22.16, it refers you back here to Isaiah 14.12. So they, they do tie it in. It isn't just an innocent thing. Okay? But now um, it says there in verse 15 in the King James Version, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. The NIV says, But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Isn't that something? Why would the NIV do that? Well, because like I said, it's satanic. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me see here. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And as you're turning there, uh, verse 16 of Isaiah 14 says, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to, earth to tremble, and that did shake kingdoms? And I've heard a lot of people, they say, you know, well, that's because... Satan's going to be so puny and we're just going to be, you know, so shocked at how puny he is. I don't think that that's the true meaning of that text. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's why I think that we're going to be shocked when we actually see Satan. Uh, another very important portion of the scriptures here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I think when we see Satan, we're going to be stunned because he's going to be appearing as an angel of light you know yes he's a serpent yes he's a red dragon but that's not how he appears these little pictures you see of the devil the little red guy with the pitchfork and the little horns and stuff no that's not satan satan is an angel of light and you see these people down through the centuries oh i saw god and he appeared to me and oh it was this beautiful being in white robes and he just glowed you saw the angel of light <laughs> Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, you know, he saw, what did he say, the angel of Moroni? Moroni. 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 You know? No. Angel of light. <laughs> A lot of these guys. Bill Schneblin, former Satanist, former Druid witch, and he saw an angel of light, you know, as part of his initiation. You know, he was in contact with devils and things, and he saw this 
bright angelic being. David Koresh, the whole Branch Davidian thing. He was seeing angels of light. You know, all these people. And they, they confuse it. And it's that's why it's very dangerous, this whole angels thing. Angels are there. They're ministering spirits. You know, they're there to protect us. But you shouldn't be trying to get in contact with them. That's very dangerous when you do that because there are more than just one type of angels out there. There are fallen angels as well. Okay. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. I want to show you something else interesting here. Ephesians 5, 9. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9. For the, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Okay, that's important to have the fruits of the Spirit. What does the NIV say? For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Why would they say light? Isn't that weird? It doesn't say, you know, why wouldn't they say fruit of the Spirit? Why would they say fruit of the light? Hmm. Angel of light, fruit of the light. I don't know. Pretty interesting. Uh, now let me just, I want to just read something here that's kind of interesting. Uh, why does Satan appear as an angel of light? Because he's a counterfeiter. Let me just give you a couple comparisons here. Jesus is the king of kings, Revelation 19. Satan is king over all the children of pride, Job 41. Jesus is the angel of God. Satan appears as an angel of light. God is light. Satan is an angel of light. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Satan is the God of this world. Christ has a bride, New Jerusalem. Satan has a bride, Mystery Babylon. Uh, Jesus cites the scripture in conflict. Satan cites the scripture in conflict when he was with Jesus. You know, it is written, it is written, it is written again, back and forth. Satan is not ignorant of the scriptures. He knows what they say. We're going to look at that in a little bit, too. Uh, Christ preaches 42 months. The beast preaches 42 months. Interesting. Christ means anointed. Satan is the anointed cherub that covereth. Uh, God desires worship. Satan desires worship. So, and that's just a few there are many more comparisons where Satan, you know, people, most Christians have this Hollywood mentality that God's in heaven and Satan's down in hell and they're, you know, at war and, and Satan does things and God's going, oh, no, 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 Satan is in the throne room. We're going to see that in just a little bit and why he is in the throne room. Okay, Job 1. Job chapter 1. So where we're turning to now. This is also another very important portion of Scripture. Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. The sons of, the God, the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels, by the way. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Satan has to report before the Lord. Okay? He can't do anything without God's permission. Verse 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed his, the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But pour, put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon him put, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Okay. Turn back to Genesis 18. Genesis chapter 18, verse 20. Here you have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you have Lot um, 
living there, and God is speaking with Abraham. Okay, uh, Genesis eighteen twenty, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. Remember he said about the land cries out there in Leviticus? Okay, um, verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? You know one of the reasons America hasn't been destroyed? Because of Christians. God will spare a nation if there are people in it that are righteous. You know, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is reproach unto any people, says Aaron Psalms. That's the reason that America has been spared from God's wrath. But the point is, there comes a point where the land cries out and, and God has to act and has to judge a nation. Okay? And God will spare that nation. He is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Okay? So God is sparing. God said that he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah if... Abraham could find 50 righteous men. We're not going to read all the verses, but it's kind of funny because, you know, God keeps turning to walk away and Abraham, you know, you can just kind of see him there count on his fingers. Well, let's see, there's Lot. Um, no, he moved. Uh, yeah, he's not there anymore either. Oh, boy, you know, there's Lot. <laughs> and then he says, well, how about 40? How about 30? How about 20? And uh, look down at verse 32. Speaking Abraham here, he, he says, And he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left continue, or communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Now, did God find ten righteous men? Nope. He found one, essentially and his wife, and two of his daughters. And by the way, those daughters had, they had uh, fiancés, essentially. They were betrothed to be married. They didn't leave. Okay? It was just Lot and his two daughters that actually got out of there because the wife turned back. Um, again, we're not going to cover all that, but turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. And we're going to see this thing again, of God sparing a nation because of righteous people. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Okay. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. You know, it's frustrating sometimes, you know, as a Christian, you know, you realize that there really aren't that many good Christians out there. I know with churches, we've all been through it. You go and you visit a lot of different places and it's just like, aren't there any good Christians left? You know, aren't there any churches left? Well, God still has a small remnant in this country. And he wants that remnant spread out, by the way, which is kind of tough. You know, we'd all like to be together all, you know, one big happy family here in America, but it'd be too easy for the devil to take that out then. So God wants his troops, if you will. He wants us spread out. A little bit here, a little bit there, getting his work done. Okay, that's that's something that the devil's going to have a hard time stopping. So uh, you're part of the small remnant if you're a Christian and a Bible believer. Uh, turn to Second Peter chapter 2. Getting close to being done here. It's another 30 or 40 places to turn now. Just kidding. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 
Here we see God talking about some of the, you know, the situation pre-flood and then the world up through this time of all this paganism in the Old Testament. Second Peter chapter two, verse four. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And of course, I think all of us can testify to that. You get out there among the, the lost world, it can be very vexing to your soul. You, hearing profanity, hearing everything else, that can be rough. And there's another study here I'm already kind of going long here, so we're not going to get into it. But there are two types here, Noah and Lot. Noah was saved from the flood, but he went through the flood. So God delivered him through the flood. He brought him through it. Okay, that's going to be your tribulation saint. Lot was saved from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but he was taken out before the destruction came. So you have... Two types there. And again, you can get in a lot more into that. But Lot, I believe, is a type of the Christian that is going to be removed from this world system before God pours out his wrath. And Noah is going to be the type of the tribulation saint, the Jew in particular, that is taken. He's saved, but he's taken through the tribulation, through the flood. Okay, but that's another study. Revelation chapter 12. What is Satan doing right now? Okay, where is he at? What's he What's he working hard on? Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And we're going to see why Satan is for things like Halloween, things like witchcraft. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Okay, this hasn't happened yet. You hear a lot of people saying, Oh, Satan's a defeated foe. No, he isn't. Not yet. He will be, but he isn't yet. What's he doing right now? He's accusing the brethren saved Christians, he's accusing us day and night before the Lord. And you see, Satan is smart enough to realize God has written in his word what is sin and what is iniquity. And he says, My God, look, they just committed that sin. What are you going to do about it? I mean, come on, you said in your word, and he's probably quoting scripture and he, you know, you're not, thou shalt not commit adultery. They committed adultery. What are you going to do about it, God? See, it's not that he's up there accusing because he just doesn't have anything better to do. No, he's trying to get God to pour out his wrath on the people. So Satan wants to turn people into things like witchcraft and Satanism and the occult and all kinds of sins, not because, not necessarily because he wants to be worshipped through it, but mainly because he knows, hey, the best way I can get these people is to get them to do, to, to do things that God condemns in his word. And the more sin he can get a people to do, the more God's judgment has to come to those people. That's why he's the accuser of the brethren. Okay, but look up at verse uh, 7 there in chapter 12. And this describes what happens here in verse, or why verse 10 happened. Okay, and there were there was war in heaven... Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, clarifies it, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's not going to be a very good thing for the people of the earth. 
Uh, verse 12, jump down to verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Okay, that's going to be pretty bad. And you see, again, he's up in heaven as the accuser of the brethren. And when he gets kicked out, he doesn't come down and say, well, now I can be worshipped and I'm going to love these people. He comes down with great wrath and because he realizes, I have a short time here. I'm going to be going to hell. I'm going to be going to lake of fire forever. I'm going to take as many people as I can with me. That's what he wants to do. That's why the devil is, you know, people say about Satanism, all, you know, devil worship and stuff. Really, in reality, Satanism, if you study it, again, don't, unless the Lord's called you into it, but it's mostly flesh-centered. Fornication, drugs, it's it's mostly that. It's it's They're not actually worshiping the devil. They just have something in their head that they they're thinking it's just an excuse to be wicked okay and it's rebellion against god is, is really what satanism is and i don't think that the devil's up there going oh look at all those people down there that are worshiping me that's great maybe a little bit but he's realizing i'm going to hell so therefore i deceive all those people down there and i get them all into all these false religions and all this worship you know and it's turning god against them see god doesn't have pleasure in the wicked or pleasure in the death of the wicked. But Satan forces people to be wicked, gets deceives them to be wicked, so that God's wrath is poured out on them. So God has to punish them. That's why he does those things. Turn over to Revelation 19. So Satan's down on the earth in the tribulation. Halfway through the tribulation is when that thing happens, the war in heaven, Satan's cast out, which is kind of interesting when you think about it because if Christians are taken up before the tribulation there's a pretty real possibility that the devil's going to be there for the first three and a half years. It's kind of weird. But he gets kicked out of heaven halfway through the tribulation. Now at the end of the tribulation, chapter 19, verse 11. Okay. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Okay, look at chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Again, clarifies it so there's no mistake. And bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So Satan is bound for the thousand years. That's why it's going to be a kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness. Okay, verse 7. We'll jump down to verse 7 here. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, 
and shall go, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. If you remember back in uh, Ezekiel 28, it talked about that this anointed cherub would eventually be burnt in front of everybody and reduced to ashes. I believe that's where it is there. Um, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire, again, because you realize you have more than just a body, body, soul, and spirit. So he could have been burnt to ashes and still his soul be cast into the lake of fire. Um, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice there that the beast and the false prophet are in the lake of fire after a thousand years. Okay, so this thing of, well, you know, hell is just a grave or, you know, you just burn up real quick. Annihilation. No. Hmm? Annihilation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's not true. Uh, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, finally one more verse, and then we're done. Job chapter 2. We're going to go back to the story of Job and God giving Satan permission to attack him. And I'm going to show you why the devil is for things like Halloween, for things like witchcraft, any celebration of death or evil. Job chapter 2, verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. After Satan attacked him, killed most of his family, and destroyed most of his goods, he still didn't blame God. But look at what God says here. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. That's the purpose of all this evil stuff that's going on in the world, is for Satan to move God against people. That's why he's the accuser of the brethren. That's why he wants this evil. It's not necessarily for his own worship. It's because he knows that if he can turn God against the people, then God will have to punish him. And so this thing of, well, how can we fix America if we could? And I don't think we can, prophetically speaking, but how could we? By turning back to God and no other way. You know, you can't keep this evil and keep the sin and have God's blessing as a nation. is isn't going to happen. So that's it for this morning.